War and Peace, Book One, Chapter Nine, read for LibriVox.org by Richard Grove. It was past one o'clock when Pierre left his friend. It was a cloudless northern summer night. Pierre took an open cab, intending to drive straight home. But the nearer he drew to the house, the more he felt the impossibility of going to sleep on such a night. It was light enough to see a long way in the deserted street, and it seemed more like morning or evening than night. On the way, Pierre remembered that Anatole Kuragin was expecting the usual set for cards that evening, after which there was generally a drinking bout, finishing with visits of a kind Pierre was very fond of. I should like to go to Kuragin's, thought he. But he immediately recalled his promise to Prince Andrew not to go there. Then, as happens to people of weak character, he desired so passionately once more to enjoy that dissipation he was so accustomed to that he decided to go. The thought immediately occurred to him that his promise to Prince Andrew was of no account, because before he gave it, he had already promised Prince Anatole to come to his gathering. Besides, thought he, all such words of honor are conventional things with no definitive meaning, especially if one considers that by tomorrow one may be dead or something so extraordinary may happen to one that honor and dishonor will be all the same. Pierre often indulged in reflections of this sort, nullifying all his decisions and intentions. He went to Kuragin's. Reaching the large house near the horse's guard's barracks in which Anatole lived, Pierre entered the lighted porch, ascended the stairs, and went in the open door. There was no one in the anteroom. Empty bottles, cloaks, and overshoes were lying about, there was a smell of alcohol and sounds of voices shouting in the distance. Cards and supper were over, but the visitors had not yet dispersed. Pierre threw off his cloak and entered the first room, in which were the remains of supper. A footman, thinking no one saw him, was drinking on the sly what was left in the glasses. From the third room came sounds of laughter, the shouting of familiar voices, the growling of a bear, and general commotion. Some eight or nine young men were crowding anxiously around an open window. Three others were romping with a young bear, one pulling him by the chain and trying to set him at the others. I bet a hundred on Stevens, shouted one. Mine, no holding on, cried another. I bet on Dolokhov, cried a third. Kiragin, you part our hands. There, leave Bruin alone. Here's a bet on. At one draught, or he loses, shouted a fourth. Jacob, bring the bottle, shouted the host. A tall, handsome fellow who stood in the midst of the group without a coat and with his fine linen shirt unfastened in front. Wait a bit, you fellows. Here's Petya, good man, cried he, addressing Pierre. Another voice from a man of medium height with clear blue eyes, particularly striking amongst all these drunken voices by its sober ring, cried from the window, Come here, part the bats. This was Dolokhov, an officer of the Semenov regiment a notorious gambler and duelist who was living with Anatole. Pierre smiled, looking about him merrily. I don't understand. What's it all about? Wait a bit. He's not drunk yet. A bottle here, said Anatole. Taking a glass from the table, he went up to Pierre. First of all, you must drink. Pierre drank one glass after another. Looking from under his brows at the tipsy guests who were again crowding around the window and listening to their chatter, Anatole kept on refilling Pierre's glass while explaining that Dolokhov was betting with Stevens, an English naval officer, that he would drink a bottle of rum sitting on the outer ledge of the third floor with his legs hanging out. Go on, you must drink it all, said Anatole, giving Pierre the last glass, or I won't let you go. No, I won't, said Pierre, pushing Anatole aside, and he went up to the window. Dolokhov was holding the Englishman's hand and clearly and distinctively repeating the terms of the bet, addressing himself particularly to Anatole and Pierre. Dolokhov was of medium height, with curly hair and light blue eyes. He was about twenty-five. Like all infantry officers, he wore no moustache, so that his mouth, the most striking feature of his face, was clearly seen. The lines of that mouth were remarkably finely curved. The middle of the upper lip formed a sharp wedge and closed firmly on the firm lower one, and something like two distinct smiles played continually round the two corners of his mouth. 
This, together with the resolute, insolent intelligence of his eyes, produced an effect which made it impossible not to notice his face. Dolokhov was a man of small means and no connections, yet though Anatol spent tens of thousands of rubles, Dolokhov lived with him and had placed himself on such a footing that all who knew him, including Anatol himself, respected him more than they did Anatol. Dolokhov could play all games and nearly always won. However much he drank, he never lost his clear-headedness. Both Kiragin and Dolokhov were at that time notorious among the rakes and scapegraces of Petersburg. The bottle of rum was brought. The window frame, which prevented anyone from sitting on the outer sill, was being forced out by two footmen, who were evidently flurried and intimidated by the directions and shouts of the gentlemen around. Anatol, with his swaggering air, strode up to the window. He wanted to smash something. Pushing away the footman, he tugged at the frame, but could not move it. He smashed a pane. You have a try, Hercules, he said, turning to Pierre. Pierre seized the crossbeam, tugged, and wrenched the oak frame out with a crash. Take it right out, or they'll think I'm holding on, said Dolokhov. Is the Englishman bragging, eh? Is it all right, said Anatole? First rate, said Pierre, looking at Dolokhov, who with a bottle of rum in his hand was approaching the window, from which the light of the sky, the dawn merging with the afterglow of sunset, was visible. Dolokhov, the bottle of rum still in his hand, jumped onto the window sill. Listen, cried he, standing there and addressing those in the room. All were silent. I bet fifty imperials. He spoke French that the Englishman might understand him, but he did not speak it very well. I bet fifty imperials. Or do you wish to make it a hundred, added he, addressing the Englishman. No, fifty, replied the latter. All right, fifty imperials, that I will drink a whole bottle of rum without taking it from my mouth, sitting outside the window on this spot. He stooped and pointed to the sloping edge outside the window, and without holding on to anything. Is that right? Quite right, said the Englishman. Anatole turned to the Englishman and taking him by one of the buttons of his coat, and looking down at him, the Englishman was short, began repeating the terms of the wager to him in English. Wait, cried Dolokhov, hammering with the bottle on the window sill to attract attention. Wait a bit, Kiragin, listen. If anyone else does the same, I will pay him a hundred imperials, you understand? The Englishman nodded, but gave no indication whether he intended to accept this challenge or not. Anatole did not release him, and though he kept nodding to show that he understood, Anatole went on translating Dolokhov's words into English. A thin young lad, a hussar of the lifeguards who had been losing that evening, climbed on the window sill, leaned over, and looked down. Oh, 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 he muttered, looking down from the window at the stones of the pavement. Shut up, cried Dolokhov, pushing him away from the window. The lad jumped awkwardly back into the room, tripping over his spurs. Placing the bottle on the window sill, where he could reach it easily, Dolokhov climbed carefully and slowly through the window and lowered his legs. Pressing against both sides of the window, he adjusted himself on his seat, lowered his hands, moved a little to the right and then to the left, and took up the bottle. Anatol brought two candles and placed them on the window sill, though it was already quite light. Dolokhov's back in his white shirt and his curly head were lit up from both sides. Everyone crowded to the window, the Englishman in front. Pierre stood smiling, but silent. One man, older than the others present, suddenly pushed forward with a scarred and angry look and wanted to seize hold of Dolokhov's shirt. I say, this is folly, he'll be killed, said this more sensible man. Anatol stopped him. Don't touch him. You startle him and then he'll be killed, eh? What then, eh? Dolokhov turned round and again holding on with both hands, arranged himself in his seat. If anyone comes meddling again, said he, emitting the words separately through his thin, compressed lips, I will throw him down there. Now then. Saying this, he again turned round, dropped his hands, took the bottle and lifted it to his lips, threw back his head and raised his free hand to balance himself. One of the footmen, who had stooped to pick up some broken glass, remained in that position without taking his eyes from the window and from Dolokhov's back. Anatol stood erect with staring eyes. 
The Englishman looked on sideways, pursing his lips. The man who had wished to stop the affair ran to a corner of the room and threw himself on a sofa with his face to the wall. Pierre hid his face, from which a faint smile forgot to fade, though his features now expressed horror and fear. All were still. Pierre took his hands from his eyes. Dolokhov still sat in the same position. Only his head was thrown further back until his curly hair touched his shirt collar, and the hand holding the bottle was lifted higher and higher and trembled with the effort. The bottle was emptying perceptibly and rising still higher and his head tilting yet farther back. Why is it so long, thought Pierre. It seemed to him that more than half an hour had elapsed. Suddenly, Dolokhov made a backward movement with his spine, and his arm trembled nervously. This was sufficient to cause his whole body to slip as he sat on the sloping edge. As he began slipping down, his head and arm wavered still more with the strain. One hand moved as if to clutch the window sill, but refrained from touching it. Pierre again covered his eyes and thought he would never open them again. Suddenly, he was aware of a stir all around. He looked up. Dolokhov was standing on the windowsill with a pale but radiant face. Ah, oh, it's empty. He threw the bottle to the Englishman who caught it neatly. Dolokhov jumped down. He smelt strongly of rum. Well done. Fine fellow. Now there's a bet for you. Devil take you came from different sides. The Englishman took out his purse and began counting out the money. Dolokhov stood frowning and did not speak. Pierre jumped upon the windowsill. Gentlemen! Who wishes to bet with me? I'll do the same thing, he suddenly cried, even without a bet. There, tell them to bring me a bottle. I'll do it. Bring a bottle. Let him do it. Let him do it, said Dolokhov, smiling. What next? Have you gone mad? No one would let you. Why, you go giddy on a staircase, exclaimed several voices. I'll drink it. Let's have a bottle of rum, shouted Pierre, banging the table with a determined and drunken gesture and preparing to climb out of the window. They seized him by his arms, but he was so strong that everyone who touched him was sent flying. No, you'll never manage him that way, said Anatole. Wait a bit, and I'll get round him. Listen, I'll take your bet tomorrow, but now we're all going to... Uh... <laughs> Come on, then, cried Pierre. Come on! We'll take Bruin with us. And he caught the bear, took it in his arms, lifted it from the ground, and began dancing round the room with it. End of chapter 9